before we start our episode today, this is just a reminder, History Hack does have a Patreon account and all of your donations are gratefully appreciated. There's lots of perks on there, secret groups on Facebook. Do get involved. We would love to see more of you. Enjoy the episode today. Hello and welcome to another episode of History Hack. I'm here with Zach today. Hello, Zach. Hello, boss. How are you doing? I'm all right. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. I'm fulfilling my role as chief of staff. We've got a whole load of really good episodes lined up over the next few days because we record them in batches. Because, you know, we, we actually do prep and stuff. Not that people oh, realise it. Mad. You are my woolly now. Apparently I'm Haig and you are woolly. Well, that's preferable to me being like, what was it, Ludendorff, Ludendorff. or something? And you yeah, were no, you want to be on the losing side. No, no, no that's I rubbish. If I don't want to be Ludendorff, it was a fascist git. Well, this this too. Um, I mean, for me, that, that's a bigger <laughs> deal than just, you know, the Germans last World War I, <laughs> not a fascist. Anyway, um, we're not talking about the Nazis today. Uh, we are joined instead by Chris Pears, who is an expert on African colonial warfare and has a string of books to his name, including The African Wars, Warriors and Soldiers of the Colonial Campaigns and Warrior Peoples of East Africa, 1840 to 1900. But we're not focusing on that so much today as talking about one of his latest books, which is really a, a novel take on Rourke's Drift and his Andalwana, two battles that we were talking about quite recently, weren't we, with uh, mm. Kit on Most Pointless Battle. So, Chris, welcome to History Hack. It's great to have you on. How are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. I'm very glad to be here. Um, thank you very much for inviting me. I've got to say, we're really looking forward to this. Rourke's Drift and Isandawana are, are two battles I don't know huge amounts about, but what I know and the more I dig really kind of interests me. So let's start with this book. And, and why is it different? Because we, because of, you know, we everybody knows that, you know, if you've seen Zulu, then Michael Caine turns up, they all start singing in Welsh. None of that actually happens, but let's kind of ignore that, that fact because it makes a great kind of moment in, in cinema history. But we get a lot of kind of narratives of Isadawana and Rourke's Drift. So why is this one different? Well, yes, I'll be the first to agree that there's an awful lot being written about these two battles. But the idea, which wasn't mine, it's, this is due to my publisher, Michael Leventhal, was to write it in chronological order as a, a minute by minute, hour by hour narrative rather than a separate narratives of two different battles. Because this Sandrana and Rourke's Drift were fought on the same day, within a few miles of each other, but they're usually treated as two quite different things. If you use this approach and look at what's happening simultaneously at different times of the day, it can give you an insight into things that people don't normally notice. For example, um, there is a battalion of um, Natal native contingent troops under Major Bengal, which managed to miss both battles completely. Um, it wasn't his fault. He'd just been given rather strange and contradictory orders. Um, and he could have been very useful in either, either place. But as it turned out, he was sort of stuck between the two, not really knowing what was going on. Um, and that is the kind of thing that you don't notice if you focus on one battle or the other. Um, again, for example, there's an Inspector Mansell who has uh, some very interesting testimony about what was happening in the camp of the San Juana, uh, except that his timing has to be completely wrong. Uh, again, when you look at what's happening on Lord Chelmsford's front and what's happening at the camp of the San Juana, he can't possibly have seen what he said he saw at the time he said he saw it, um, because by the time he would have got to the inside of the camp, everything would have been over, but instead he saw guns firing and so on. So there's various possibilities. I think he simply got the timing wrong. He'd forgotten when he'd been sent out. People had other things to do than keep looking at their watches. Um, but if you just look at the one battle in isolation, you tend not to notice. So I think that's one um, very useful thing that comes out of this approach but also I just enjoyed writing it because it it's a very dramatic narrative that way and I'm hoping that it comes over that way when you read it. It certainly does and um, the contra contrast between these two actions is quite staggering. Should we start by telling our listeners where are we 
how did we get there? Who's present? And what is everyone expecting at the beginning of the 22nd of January, 1879? Right, well, we are in Zululand, which is part of what is now called KwaZulu-Natal province in South Africa. Um, we're a few miles inland from the Indian Ocean coast of South Africa, um, facing each other across the Buffalo River. Now, the first question is, what on earth are the British doing there in the first place? And you have to go a long way back to, to, to really understand that. The British took over the Cape of Good Hope during the Napoleonic Wars. Um, found, as the Dutch had already found, that South Africa was a very congenial place for European settlers, and very soon found themselves embroiled in all sorts of things that were going on between the Europeans and the local Africans. In the 1820s, the Zulus had set up their own kingdom and launched a series of campaigns under their founder, Shaka, which had led to them being the main military power in the area. But by the 1870s, they were faced with a British colony in Natal, just to the south, across the river. And both sides were fairly nervous of each other. The British government didn't want a war, but some of the people on the ground in South Africa certainly did. Um, the, the, the idea was to bring about a confederation of everyone south of the Limpopo River, roughly what is now South Africa, bring them into a confederation under British control. That included the Boers, the Africans and the British. The one outstanding power that had not been brought under British control at this point was the Zulus. So it's a complicated story, but basically the, some of the powers that be in South Africa had manufactured this war. There was no real need for it. Um, they'd persuaded the British government that the Zulus were a threat, whereas in fact, they were very much on the defensive. And Lord Chelmsford, who'd been put in charge of the British forces, um, was planning an invasion on three separate fronts to cross the Buffalo River, capture the Zulu king and his capital, and bring the whole area under British control. Of course, this didn't really work. Chelmsford's main column, number two column, which crossed the river in the center, reached its camp at Isandwana, which is a, it's a very prominent hill, which is a very, very well-known landmark in the area. Um, and they camped underneath this landmark in the middle of what looks like a fairly open plain and prepared to move on eastwards towards the heart of Zululand. After a few days there, Chelmsford sends out a patrol under a major Dartnell. And Early in the morning of 22nd of January, he woken up by a messenger from Dartmoor saying, we found the Zulu main army. So Chelmsford immediately put a force together and marches out to fight it. It isn't the Zulu main army. The Zulu main army is in fact on his flank to the north, then he has no idea that it's there. So this is the situation we find ourselves in at the beginning of the 22nd of January. Um, Chelmsford has split his force marched out with one battalion of British infantry to fight what he thinks is the Zulu army and left another battalion guarding the camp right underneath where the real Zulu army actually is. So let's start chucking some times into this then. So you, you talked about where we are, if you like, sort of at, at, at the start, uh, you know, at 0000, zero, zero, zero or, of the 22nd of January. By 4.30 a.m. we're looking at what's known as the Horns of the Morning. What does that actually mean? Well, the Zulu language is a very poetic one and cattle imagery is very common because cattle are absolutely central to Zulu culture. So what they mean by that is the time when the sky is just getting light enough in the east to see the horns of your cattle herd against the sky. Um, and that obviously is to, is to the Zulus the time when the day starts, when you can actually start to see your cows, you can start to do something useful. 
So at that point, the Zulus, you imagine the Zulus in a, in a bivouac, in a, in a valley, the Gwebeni Valley, um, up on the plateau overlooking the British camp. That's about the time when they start to, to wake up and move and, and, and start to send out patrols and, and start to deploy. But by then the British army is well on the, on the way. Um, the British forces are already split. Lord Chelmsford is already halfway to where he wants to be, is that they'd started much earlier. So men are advancing by sort of 9 a.m. Men are advancing towards the Findo Hills, aren't they? So is this where things begin to go wrong? I think you could say they've already gone wrong by this stage, but they just don't know it yet. <laughs> yes, Lord, Chelmsford, yeah, Lord Chelmsford is launching an attack on the Findo Hills, but the people there are not the main Zulu army. They're just some local troops who are just in his way temporarily. And the main Zulu army, as I've just said, is already on his flank and he knows nothing about it. So he's already in big trouble. Um, from the camp, Colonel Pullane, who's been left in charge of the camp, can see or has reported to him various movements of Zulus on the plateau overlooking it. If you envisage that this camp is in a very, very wide valley and about a mile or so from the, the northern edge of it, is, is quite the rim of a plateau. The hill of Isandwana looks quite spectacular, but it doesn't overlook the rim of that plateau. So what's going on on there, he can't see. Um, but there are Zulus moving about. Um, we're not quite sure why they're moving about at this point. It could be that they're already deploying some battle formation. It could be that there simply wasn't room for them all in the valley where they were hiding. But it is reported to him there are Zulus moving. So he stands to, um, sometime after seven o'clock, actually, he orders his men to fall in. And later on, falls them out again to have breakfast when nothing happens. So there's already hints that something is going on at nine o'clock, but no one at this stage knows what it is. So am I right in thinking that communication problems are a part of what goes wrong? for the British here, because by 10.35 in the morning, the officers are now starting to scream at each other, aren't they? Yes, yeah, so what's happened is Chelmsford, before he went, um, sent some orders to Colonel Anthony Durnford, who was leading one of the other columns, and told him, he's at Rock's Drift at this point, uh, he wants him to reinforce the camp of the Sandwana. So he tells him to move up to the camp of the Sandwana and he says um, mounted troops and artillery are going out to attack the enemy, but he doesn't actually tell Durnford whether he's supposed to take command of the camp, reinforce the camp, or go on and reinforce Chelmsford. The orders are, are ambiguous. So Durnford's arrived at the camp at 10.30 and doesn't really know what to do next. His plan, in fact, is to take his mounted troops and go on and catch up Chelmsford. Now, if, in fact, what Durnford thought was happening was happening. He would by now be a hero. He'd, he'd won the VC instead of being partly blamed for the disaster. Because it's possible the Zulus could have moved against Chelmsford's rear, in which case Durnford would have galloped up like the, the US cavalry and, and, and probably saved him. Um, it's not Durnford's fault that this isn't what's happening, but he wants to go out and help Chelmsford. So he says to Colonel Pauline, can I have some of your infantry? Colonel Pauline says, no, you can't, because I've been ordered to defend the camp and I haven't got enough people anyway. So they do have a bit of an argument. And the result is that Durnford goes off and says, well, all right, I'm going to do this on my own, and, uh, and, and rides off in, in the direction of, of Lord Chelmsford. Um, at this stage, there's still no one knows exactly what's going on with the Zulus. Um, the main Zulu body hasn't moved. Um, it's still sitting in its, in its bivouac. And... No one really believes that they intended to fight on that day. It was a bad day. It was the day of the, the new moon and it was an ill omen day for fighting. So although the Zulus are moving about in various ways, they're not let, yet launched an attack. So at noon, things really start to go downhill. Is that right? Yes. Um, one of the things Durnford has done, he sends some cavalry up onto the plateau to see what's happening, which is an excellent plan, except that it inadvertently triggers the whole Zulu attack. Um, they're, they're still sitting in their, in their bivouac and, and basically some British cavalry come up to the 
to the edge of the of the hollow they're in and look down at them and see that see the Zulus. The Zulus realize they're spotted an attack without orders. Their commander, Jing Rayo, manages to get them into some sort of battle formation, but he can't stop them advancing. So suddenly there's perhaps 20,000 Zulus charging towards the edge of the plateau, and they start by 12 o'clock, people can see there's something gone wrong. Durnford has a rocket battery, which is supposed to support him, but he's left it behind. He's too eager and he's gone galloping off with his cavalry and left it straggling across the plain. The Zulus catch that and wipe it out. Um, they also start to come down off the top of the plateau and, and threaten the camp. Durnford realizes that he can't fight his way through this lot. Because what he now sees in front of him is the Zulu left wing, which is encircling him. The main Zulu doctrine was always that you spread out into what they call the horns of the bull. Um, you had your fastest, youngest units on the, on the flanks, and they moved fast and they encircled you. And this is what they're trying to do. So Durnford has to fall back um, to a defensive position. Poulain has to try and get his infantry into some sort of firing line. And all the time, the Zulus are just, just pouring down the slope. So it must be absolute pandemonium at this point. Can I just interject to ask, because as someone who doesn't cover this, I'm assuming, uh, outrageously perhaps, that the Zulus are armed with the spears and shields that I've seen traveling around that area of Africa. Um, do they have any more modern weaponry or well, as well? Have they sort of inherited any of that from anyone or, or bought any of it from anywhere? They have a lot of guns. Okay, um, so they, that was king, that's beyond me. <laughs> well, yeah, the King Sichuayo has actually been telling them to go and buy guns for okay. quite some time from white traders. The problem is that these are not very good guns. Okay. Over the last 20 years, there's been a technological revolution in Europe and the old fashioned muzzle loader, like the brand Bess that they used at Waterloo, mm. has been phased out in favor of breech loading rifles like the Martini Henry, which have a much better range, much more accurate, better hitting power and can be fired much faster. So what European armies have done is sold all the old surplus muskets to places like Africa. Okay. And the Zulus have brought these up. So while they have a lot of guns, they're not up to date guns. They're much shorter ranged. So they have a go at uh, certainly at, at using them, at engaging in this firefight. But at the range that the Martini Henry can hit them, they can't do anything. Yeah. So they're, they're forced to fall back on the traditional Zulu doctrine, which is get stuck in at close quarters with spears. But they have massively overwhelming numbers, which makes up for any technological deficit. Is that right? Um, they have overwhelming numbers, but it wouldn't normally make up for, for this problem. The British have had experience fighting other people in South Africa, the Holster and, and people like that, who found that they could not get to close quarters against British rifle fire, no matter how many of them there were. But this is one of Lord Chelmsford's problems. He believes that that is the lesson from his previous campaign, that it, regardless of numbers, the British will always be able to hold out. But the Zulus are a rather different army. Mm. They're very disciplined. They've got this tremendous regimental tradition, much like the British have. They have pride in their regiment. They have a great deal of cohesion as a fighting force. And they have this doctrine, which was uh, taught them by Shaka, who founded the kingdom, which actually means that they're very much more formidable than, than most African armies would be in this situation. Excellent, thank you. So can I, again, kind of go off on a little bit of a tangent here, because I'm interested at the point at which there may or may not have been scope for the British to kind of salvage this. And I'm thinking particularly with a kind of Napoleonic hat on, which is that there are contingencies, uh, you know, 60, 70 years before this point of, you know, if, if everything's going wrong, you do something like form a rally square and you bring all of your, your flanks in on themselves and you just try and hold a position. So at what point does it become too late? Because we're talking a lot about extended firing lines, which obviously in the face of such overwhelming numbers are gonna be incredibly fragile when you've got these, this, this huge encirclement going on around you. So at what point was there scope to abandon the plans that they were actually engaged in and try and just get out or get out with as many men as they possibly could? Right, yes, you're right. The British 
soldiers were deployed in open order in firing lines with the idea that even so they'd be able to stop the Zulus before they got anywhere near. But Lord Chelmsford, he wasn't quite as clueless as we've made him sound. Then he had a plan, um, which was quite a good one for defending the camp in exactly this situation. Um, so you would have had the firing line in the front, you'd have had some, the cavalry and auxiliary troops on the flank to prevent the Zulus outflanking you, and you'd had a second line of British soldiers ready to plug any gaps, ready to advance against the Zulus who are coming round the flank. The problem is what Chelmsford has done in his eagerness, he's taken half that force away. So Colonel Pauline can deploy most of it, but he can't deploy the cavalry on the flanks and he can't deploy that second line of infantry because he's no longer in command of them. So the plan immediately starts to look a bit, a bit dubious at this point. And you're right, they could have formed a square. If you'd had time, they could have got the wagons into, into a lager, such as the Boers always used very successfully against the Zulus. He could have got his troops inside and quite possibly held them off. The one problem with that is his orders were to defend the camp. And the camp was a very big sprawling place full of tents and oxen and wagons and all sorts of things. And if he had done that, he wouldn't be defending the camp. He'd have had to let the Zulus loot the camp while his men sort of marched off um, shoulder to shoulder, trying to keep them at bay. And the question is, when did he realise that that was his only chance? When did he realise that he couldn't carry out his orders? At this point, he's still trying to make a firing line that he thinks will stop the Zulus. When they finally realise that this won't work and, and they have to form squares, they don't form a big square. Um, there's not time. They just form little clumps. So each company forms its own square. Um, and that's no good because there's no room inside. There's no room for ammunition. There's no room for officers. There's no room for any of the supplies and things that they're supposed to be guarding. So that's absolutely a last resort at this point. And uh, I think Pauline doesn't try and do that until just after one o'clock when he, he no longer has a chance because the Zulu is around his flank. I was gonna, the next one we're gonna come at you with is 115. So by this point as well, ammunition has become a problem, hasn't it? I think the ammunition question has been overstated. There's often been this story, um, which you see in the film Zulu Dawn about um, the ammunition, that quartermasters were not allowing it to be issued, that the boxes were screwed down and, and they couldn't get it out. None of this seems actually to have been the case. When the Zulus captured the camp, and we have the testimony of a man called Maloka Zulu, who, who um, was interviewed afterwards, they found thousands of rounds of ammunition. Some of it's still in the boxes, some of it lying around. They smashed the boxes open with stones, it then took them a few minutes to get the ammunition out. Um, so that wasn't really the problem. The problem, I think, was that it was getting it to the widely separated parts of the, of the force. Dernford ran out, but then Dernford had gone off and left the camp and he was a mile or so out to one flank. So it wasn't there was no ammunition, he just couldn't get to him in time. And some of those little company squares ran out, again, because they couldn't get to him. But there was no shortage of ammunition as such. And uh, the story about the boxes, anyone if desperate enough with a rifle butt could have got into a box quite easily. So tell us then about this kind of overwhelming Zulu victory, because if I remember this rightly, you, you end up a, with a situation where, as you've said already, you know, the, the, the huddles form within the, these companies, you know, just kind of everybody sort of massing together, hoping to just hold them off through the fact that you've got somebody behind you. They get overrun, and so you end up with this sort of string of little kind of mini actions, right? Where people are all kind of trying to make their own escape, and they get cornered and they get overrun, and it ends up being just a, a bit of a bloodbath. Yes, um, not a single British foot soldier got away. Um, some people did get away, some people on horses got away, and some of the African troops who were less well equipped and could move faster. But of the British infantry, not, not a single one of them escaped because they were surrounded. The Zulu outflanking forces eventually met up behind the British. And from that point onwards, those 
isolated little squares couldn't really survive. They were going to eventually be worn away and, and overrun. And that is what happened. We have the testimony of quite a few survivors who did escape. Um, often they were officers who had horses and just rode for the crossing across the river um, back into Natal. Um, Burnford himself didn't escape, but some of his men did. Um, he, he made one of the last stands and was killed there. So yes, it was, as you say, a complete bloodbath. And there were something like 800 British and perhaps 500 local um, colonial or African soldiers killed on the field. When Lord Chelmsford got back there in the evening, they found not a single survivor was left. The Zulus were incredibly thorough at their mopping up. So we talked about that's a cost in men. What about a cost in material as well? Well, yes, they'd lost everything in the camp was lost, um, which included all the tents and the supplies, um, the ox wagons and the oxen, because the oxen were very useful loot for the Zulus. Um, the wagons weren't much use to them, but um, they, they tended to destroy everything um, mm. to deny it to the enemy. I think they did try and get some of the wagons away, but they didn't. I don't think they succeeded. They, they captured um, a couple of artillery pieces, but they never used them. But most things were just destroyed. So the one reason why Chelmsford Column could not go anywhere and that invasion was stopped in its tracks was the loss of the entire supply train. So we've reached effectively kind of lunchtime, but the day's not over, right? This is just the first part of the day. Crushing defeat for the British. So how do the British then kind of rally from that? What's the plan to try and salvage something from all of this and stabilise the situation? Well, um, you've got the fugitives who are just trying to escape and that's all they can do. They're just riding hell for leather for the forward across the river. Um, you've got the people at Rourke's Drift who will come to in a moment who have no idea this is happening. Um, and you have Lord Chelmsford who, of course, he's still looking for his elusive enemy. Lord Chelmsford doesn't believe what he's told at first. Um, several reports get to him. He sends um, a guy called Hamilton Brown, who's always called Maori Brown because of his service in New Zealand. Um, he sends him to find out what's going on, and Brown reports back to him that he's seen the camp destroyed. Chelmsford doesn't believe him. Um, he thinks this is impossible because his previous experiences, I left a thousand men to guard the camp. He said a thousand British soldiers can't be beaten by any number of, of Africans. Eventually, he decides he's got to go back and find out what's going on. But by the time they get back, it's far too late. They arrive at the camp, just as getting dark. And you can imagine the mess that they find there. The place is carpeted with, with dead. Um, it must have been a horrific sight, and it's rather fortunate for the soldiers they couldn't see most of it because it was dark. They found they were actually sort of lying down and bivouacking on top of dead bodies. So Chelmsford hopes that not everyone is dead. Um, he suspects that most of Pauline's men have actually retreated to Rourke's Drift. Um, so his plan is he can't move in the dark, it's too dangerous. They will camp on the battlefield and they will move on to Rourke's Drift the next day which is what he does do. Beyond that, he has no plan because, well, he's, he's suffered a defeat, which is probably something that he never expected in his life and can't really take in. Yeah, especially on this scale as well. Can you tell us yeah. about Lieutenants Coghill and Melville? Right, um, Melville is the adjutant of Colonel Pauline's battalion, which means that he's an administrative officer. Mm. He's in charge of things like personnel and discipline. He's not in charge of a frontline company, which is good for him because he's got a horse and an excuse not to be on the front line. I don't mean that to sound in any way disparaging, but um, these were the men who got away, the people whose duties had not taken them right to the front line. Yeah. Now, Melville, as the adjutant, he also would have had responsibility for the colours, the Queen's colours of the regiment which was something obviously that was very much tied in with the, with the honour of the regiment and its reputation. So at some point he takes the Queen's colour 
and rides off with it for safety. No one knows for sure whether he was ordered to do it or did it on his own initiative. But I think that Pauline probably ordered him to do it. For a start, it would have been his job. The colours were something that they would have given thought to saving. And I'm sure that Pauline thought, well, let's give Melville a chance to save his life. After all, he can't do any useful here. So Melville rides off with the Queen's colours. On the way, he meets Coghill, who's um, an orderly officer who, again, he's not in charge of a, a company of troops. So he's doing nothing wrong in saving his skin. He's not abandoning his own men. Mm. Um, Coghill can't dismount and fight because he's got an injured knee, but he can ride. So they ride hell for leather for the ford across the river. After various adventures, they actually get across um, where they are killed um, by no one quite knows who. Some previously friendly Zulus who could see which way the wind was blowing. Some of the Zulu army who got across the river, they kill them on the supposedly safe side of the river where they're buried, where there's a memorial to them now. And the Queen's colours get washed away in the river. The Zulus apparently don't realise what they've got there because that would be an added humiliation for the British if they took mm -hmm. them back and presented them to their king. But they don't. Um, they get washed away and they get recovered later by the British soldiers. So Melville and Coghill are, in most people's opinion, heroes. And I think that's really, that, that's fair enough. They're recommended for the Victoria Cross, but being dead, they're not eligible. At this point, you couldn't get it posthumously. It wasn't until sometime in the reign of Edward VII that changed, and they were awarded posthumously as seized. But their, their grave and the memorial to them is still there on the hill and still a popular place for people to visit. Still regularly um, decorated with wreaths and, and things like that. Um, so they, they've become, in a way, symbolic, I suppose, of the, of the defeat and of the heroic attempts to salvage something out of it. Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, the fact that the Zulus don't capture the Queen's colour is going to be a huge thing for the British in terms of kind of reducing that, that extra kind of bit of, of humiliation. Where does Rourke's Drift fit into all of this? Because this is more kind of into the late afternoon now. So in terms of timings, where have we got to and what's happening at Rourke's Drift to then lead into what we know goes on to happen? Right. Rourke's Drift is a supply base and it's guarded by one company of British infantry under Lieutenant Bromhead. There is also a Royal Engineer officer, the Lieutenant John Chard, who is there at the time. Um, he's been to his Sandwana and been sent back again because he's in charge of the bridge across the river. Um, so at Rourke's Drift, they've got nothing to do really at this point. They can hear firing in the distance. They send people up to the top of the hill with overlooks a place to see what they can see, but you can't see very much. Um, they see some figures manoeuvring in the distance. They can't tell whether they're friend or foe. Um, so basically, it's not until late afternoon that, that anything happens much at Rock's Drift. And what then does happen is that fugitives from Miss Andwana on horseback come galloping past, shouting things like, save yourselves, it's all up. You know, we've, the, the Zulus are coming and, and various other alarming comments like that. At this point, um, Chard takes command and starts putting the place in state of defence. Um, which it, it completes just in time um, because there are four units of the Zulu army forming the reserve which have not been involved in the fight. That's how overwhelming the Zulu victory is. They haven't even committed the reserve. But these four regiments, they're, they're married men. They're slightly older than most of them. Um, but they've also got a reputation to make and they wouldn't mind that some of the loot as well if they got the chance. Um, there were rival regiments who've done very well in the battle, and these people have been sitting around doing not very much. So they decide, apparently without orders, um, they are commanded by Prince Dabla Manzi, who is, is a royal prince, but he's not really, doesn't hold any formal military command. So he just happens to be the highest ranking man there. But he's not really so much commanding them as going along with them. They decide to go and attack the Drift. 
Now, you mentioned earlier the discussion about the most pointless battle in history. I'd put my money on this one because Zulus have already won the day. They don't need to pick another fight, especially one at a disadvantage against the fortified position. But they do. So is this a, a smart move by Chad? Because obviously he's kind of vindicated by what eventually happens. But you look at the numbers game and kind of go, the numbers are still kind of huge in terms of disparity. Is it the smart thing to stand and fight and, and fortify the position? Or would normally the smarter thing have been to just get the hell out of Dodge? There was some discussion about it whether they should load up the wounded, because they've got a hospital there and they've got wounded and sick people there. Now, they can't just abandon them. So the question is, should they load them up on wagons and try and get out? But it's Commissary Dalton, who, who's, um, who's one of the, uh, the, the officers there, who apparently persuades them that this won't work. The wagons will move too slowly and the Zulus will just catch them in the open. So the best thing they can do is exactly what Chad does. Um, build a defensive position, improvise it out of boxes and mealy bags and things like that. And I have to say that people, the guides at Rourke's just have told me that they have an awful lot of military men visiting from all over the world. And more or less unanimously, they approve of what Chad did. Um, it, he absolutely did it according to the book. He, he was right to stand and defend the place and he, he defended it very well. And the fighting, how does it happen? Is this kind of, again, I'm kind of influenced by what I've seen in the films, but is this kind of waves coming and going and failing it? And the fighting, it goes on, doesn't it? So it lasts on into the night. Yes, the first thing that happens is that one of Zulu regiments comes round the shoulder of the hill um, and then can see the post about 500 yards away. So they just charge it. But this doesn't work because as they get closer, they're brought under accurate rifle fire and forced to go to ground. So then the regiments that come up afterwards start to spread out ar around the south side of the post and try and surround it. Again, the typical Zulu tactic, spread out, surround them and then finish them off that way. Um, and they then start to launch a series of attacks against that side of the post, which eventually succeed in that they break into the hospital building. They set it on fire, they get inside, and they capture it. Most of the wounded are brought out, but some of them are killed, some of the defenders are killed, and the British are pushed back into an even smaller defensive perimeter. So at that point, the Zulu tactic looks pretty good. Fighting then goes on through the night, doesn't it? After about 10 o'clock, it starts to peter out. No one can see anything. And the Zulus have tried to break in to the reduced perimeter at various points. And by now they've gone all the way around to the far end where there's a cattle kraal, which is just built of, of stones. And they use that as cover and try and break in there. And the fighting carries on well into the dark until about 10 o'clock at night. But after that, it starts to peter out. There's a few alarms, but it goes a bit quiet. It's hard to fight in the dark. And the Zulus have made a mistake in setting fire to the roof of the hospital because it lights up the whole place so they can be seen. Um, they can no longer get to close quarters under cover of darkness. So gradually things get a little bit easier for the defenders. So by dawn on the 23rd, where are we in, in this timeline? Because again, the film kind of does this whole dozy thing of, oh, they all start singing and it forces them around and, and then they survive the final attack. And then, you know, it's all very sort of raw Britannia. But what's actually happening because word must have been spreading are reinforcements on the way where are we at by this point well um, at Rorke's Drift they have no idea what's happening um, with Lord Chelmsford's forces and likewise Lord Chelmsford has no idea what's happening at Rorke's Drift there was a body of Zulus suddenly reappeared about dawn and stood on a hill and watched. They didn't sing to them, unfortunately. So they just watched the defenders for a while. And then they moved off. And no one at Rorkstrift knew why at first. But the reason probably was that they could see from where they were that Lord Chelmsford was on the move again. And his column, which was a sizable force, was more or less a, another battalion of British infantry and various um, auxiliary units as well. Um, has started to move down towards the ford, um, towards Rourke's Drift. It's several miles, it takes some hours. 
as Lord Chelmsford moves down there, he passes this Zulu army going the other way. And the two armies sort of walk past each other, separated by a couple of hundred yards. And no one really has any desire to start another fight. They're all exhausted. They're all very worried about the opposition, which they can see is stronger than they thought. I think one Zulu decides they ought to attack. So he shouts to his mates, come on, let's charge. He charges, no one follows him, and a British soldier shoots him. And that's the end of that. Zulus don't push their luck anymore. They're tired, and so are Lord Chelmsford's men. So Chelmsford gets down to the board, not knowing what they're going to see, whether they're going to find total destruction or, or what. And they see a Union Jack flying on top of the post, which is obviously what they expected, what they hoped to see. And it turns out that Chard and most of his men have survived. They've had 17 killed, but most of them are okay. Um, they've held off the Zulus. Um, unfortunately, there are no survivors from Islam's armor there. Um, the ones that did get that far simply carried on riding. They'd had enough. Um, so yeah, it was a time of immense suspense followed by enormous relief on both sides. At this point that um, Chard manages to find a bottle of beer and sits down and, uh, and opens it and celebrates the fact that, that, that they have survived. I'm really not surprised. I think I'd be looking for a gin and tonic and little else at this point. There's a quote in the book mm. along the lines of, I don't know how any of us are still alive. How did they hold out? Um, well, for a start, they did have these defences. They were only biscuit boxes and bags of flour, but the position is quite a strong one. Um, along part of it, there is a, a rocky ledge, which if you go and see the place nowadays, they've partly graded that to make it easy for tourists to walk up and down on it, but some of it still survives. And it's almost six feet high. And if you imagine bags of flour on top of that, it's not easy for the Zulus to get over it. Um, it's, it's a decent, strong position. There are places where the Zulus can hide in the caves on the hill and shoot, but they're out of range of Zulu muskets. So they don't do an awful lot of damage that way. Um, so to, to kill the British soldiers, they've actually got to jump up this mini cliff, climb over the barricades and get inside of the spears. And that's difficult to do. The British soldiers are there with their fixed bayonets standing on top. And the further they're pushed back, um, the, the more densely packed they are, the harder it is to do that. So it's not that hard to understand how they survived. So they were very lucky as well. I mean, one officer killed at a strategic moment might have made all the difference and the Zulus would have been in there. And in terms of consequences, what is the, the, the legacy of, of these two battles? In the long run, probably didn't make that much difference. The British went on to win the war, but it, it set, set that back by about six months or so. Um, and it made a, a serious dent in the, the myth of, of British invincibility, most certainly. It sounds wrong is something that the Zulus are very proud of to this day, and quite rightly, that they took on the world's biggest empire and, uh, and gave them a bloody nose. Um, Professor John Laband has written a book, um, an alternative history book, uh, speculating on what might have happened if Zulus had also captured Rourke's Drift. But in the end, again, he, he, does, he concludes it wouldn't have made that much difference. Um, the Zulus might have got more advantageous peace terms out of it, but in the end, they still would have been beaten and their kingdom would have disintegrated as it actually did in the civil war soon afterwards. So the whole thing is not without consequences, but in a way, both of these battles are more a, a moral victory and something that, uh, that boosted the, the confidence and self-esteem of both sides in their own way. The Zulus afterwards, uh, subsequent battles, the Zulus were heard to shout as they advanced, we're the boys from Isandrana, but, in those later battles, they never managed to, to reproduce that success. They didn't get to close quarters and were mostly shot down. Chris, this has been so interesting. Alex and I knew we were going to love this one before Absolutely. we did it. And 
you absolutely delivered and um, you've given us a really great sense of how these two battles kind of coincide with one another and feed into one another which you don't get from watching the film so folks need to go away and buy your book they'll find it in the history hack bookstore and thanks so much for your time well thank you very much i've really enjoyed talking to you when our guests join us to talk about their work and their new book the 45 minutes or so they spend with us is just a taster of all their efforts so to this end we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org where you can find our guests' latest and greatest books. You can support them, and you can support History Hack too. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep at it and bring you more amazing guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash history hack, or just search on bookshop.org for us under the shops bit. Thank you for your continued support, and here's to your next great book.